live coding lecture. I'm gonna just uh, code in front of y'all, and we're gonna have a good time. So maybe that'll wait. Oh yeah. So uh, I don't have a a specific plan of what I want to code. I do have a default in case we don't get any ideas. Of, 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 I'll back to that. No calculator. Uh, but uh, I'll be watching the Twitch chat, and if you want to shout things out like that too. Uh, I'll take ideas and just uh, see what y'all come up with. Uh, try to get something that does change behavior depending on its internal state. And then uh, I'll try to code it without conditionals. Can't guarantee how it's going to end up or if we're going to be able to make some significant progress. Uh, but I'm going to try to show you my design process, my thought process of when I'm tackling a problem with that, uh, like that. Uh, with control flow band, of course. So it kind of narrows the scope of what we can do. The uh, uh, so yeah, if you have ideas, Twitch chat, preferably, or if you want to be brave and just shout things out like you did. Uh, and yeah, no calculator, microwave, cars, uh, none of that. I already have a suggestion. Yeah, but, yeah what's up? Um, like, water, like it has shapes, like gas, like it's, it's solid. So, so do you, if you have good behavior from that, I, I would love to go that route. Uh, that was, it was kind of suggested the states of matter in the earlier one. And this was almost a lecture question I had it half written, but I just couldn't figure out, okay, whether you're water, ice, or water vapor, what's, uh, what do we do with that? So I thought of like a person consuming this, and water, okay, ah, I can print to the screen, I'm refreshed, yes. Uh, ice, ooh, that's a little cold, and then water vapor, I just got it on the floor. Um, so I have uh, just a couple of slides I wanna go through, so we have time to think about this. If you come up with some thing, some way to apply that, I can run with that one. Because I want to do something with that. I just uh, never know where to go with it. Were there other suggestions? I saw a few other hands. Did you all have the water suggestion? I have a question. Though. Yeah. About it's the calculator. So in the document, it says that we don't have to print RHS, but it also says we do. So I'm confused. Do you have to print RHS on the calculator or not? On the display? On the As screen. you're hitting the RHS. As you're typing in the number, so for example, I wrote my LHS mm -hmm. and I press operator, but for example, plus, mm -hmm. and now I'm typing my number, which is RHS. Does the RHS have to be displayed on the calculator, or does it not? Did I uh, did I define that or not? I, I thought I I intended to. I possibly didn't. I know right after you hit the operator, what's displayed is undefined. Under, so but but right? after you start hitting buttons, um, but either way, if you just always press equals before you test. And in my primary objective testing, I always hit equals before checking your display number. So if, if that is ambiguously defined, we can get around that just by always pressing equals. So if you chain together multiple operators and then want to test that number, just give it an equal press first. So it I, doesn't I, cool. matter what the number is after a press operator? I'd have to relook at my exact wording in the document. I don't know off the top of my hand. After an operator, it's undefined. But after an operator, and then you start pushing some numbers for an RHS. I, that is intended to have to be displayed, but I would have to look at my word, exact wording to see if that made the doc in a clear way. Sorry. If I didn't, I'll stick by my doc. If there's something in the doc that is ambiguous like that, uh, I can update my primary objective testing and, and update things to make sure it's not a requirement. Uh, and, and yeah, since we're doing live coding, if you have, do have questions about the homework and other questions about the course, anything that can help you understand the state matter, that's today's goal. Monday, we really covered everything that you need to know about the state pattern. Monday, here's the state pattern, this is what it is, this is how it works. Wednesday was a more complex example and a more complicated lecture question to give you better practice with it. Today is just the next step of that. Let's give more examples, let's, give, uh, let's get out of the slides and get into IntelliJ and see another example of that in looking at my design process and how you can apply the state pattern to something brand new. So if you have other questions, anything that help you all understand the state pattern, that's what today is all about. Any other questions or comments before we, we get in right now? All right, so today's lecture question is promised a little more complicated than the last one. Not a, overly so, I didn't get too crazy with that. I actually had a more complicated one that I shared with the TAs and uh, I, I turned it down just a little bit. It's a little nerfed from, from what the TAs saw. Uh, still not necessarily easy, but today we're going to simulate a car we have these API methods. Just like last time, we have a lot of methods that are going to change the state and have some behavior. And then one method that we use to check that internal, uh, check the functionality. So in our test car, test suite, we're only checking velocity to check 
the pro for proper functionality. So again, just like the other ones, you're encouraged to write a separate test suite if you want to test your implementation specific functionality. You want to check if you're in the right state or if the state variables are working the way you expect them to be. Um, you can write another test suite, but anything in the test power, that's the one I'm going to use in the grader. Anything in there has to only call the API methods. Uh, that one that you submit has to only call those API methods uh, for a grade. Uh, again, because I'm only implementing these methods, anything, any method that you came up with or state variable that you came up with, there's no guarantee I came up with the same approach and also named variables and methods the same thing. So uh, I, I don't necessarily want to be that restrictive. Uh, it's just a logistical thing. There's no way I can come up with the same variable names as everybody in the class. Once two students have different names, well, we're already sunk. All right, so, so the car has three gears, and that, that's the kind of behavior that we're looking at. We start off in park and not moving from park. We can shift into either drive or reverse, and we have these other two states, drive and reverse. In drive, if we call accelerate, we're going to increase our speed by 10. Reverse, we're going to decrease our speed by 10. So if we're in shift, uh, uh, create a car, Shift to reverse, accelerate three times, our velocity is going to be negative 15 from that velocity method call. Calling brake in either one of these is going to put the car to a complete stop. So calling brake sets the velocity to zero, it doesn't matter what it was, it doesn't matter if you're going 100 or 1,000 or a million or just negative five, it's gonna set it to zero, absolutely. Um, this is one of the things where for these lecture questions and for the homework assignments, these are very carefully crafted to make sure you don't have to use a conditional. Typically, if you're using the state pattern in real life, out there in the real world, there are gonna be cases where you're gonna pull in a conditional or two, you're gonna use everything else in your coding toolbox. Um, these, so I have to craft these questions very specifically to not require a conditional. Uh, that's why grade is setting it to zero instead of decreasing and then saying, if you're at zero, now you're stopped again, you have to have a conditional in there somewhere. We set this to zero, that's uh, me designing the question so you don't, so we can avoid that conditional. Same is true with all these. The only one Wednesday's lecture question brushed up against that line just a little bit with the max and min volume. And then I gave that bonus slide with math.max, math.min, math so you can get around that. But mo notably with that, when you hit max volume or the min volume, the state did not change. If there was a state transition in either one of those cases, we wouldn't be able to do that. In this case, we need a state transition when the car stops because there's different behavior if the car stopped or moving. So we can't get away with that, so brake always sets it to zero. So if you're wondering how the why this behavior is there, and, uh, and seeing some of the limitations of the state pattern, that's one of the limitations if we're not using any control flow, which is unrealistic. Uh, and if you're moving in either drive or reverse, you can't shift at all. If you're stopped in drive or reverse, you can shift to park, but you can never shift from uh, park, but you can never shift from reverse to drive or drive to reverse. You can't shift between those two, uh, regardless of any other state. So this one, a little bit more complicated than, than the last one, stepping up a little bit. Uh, here, the states are kind of straightforward, park, drive, and reverse. Those jump out at you as different states the car can be in. But we also have different behavior while we're driving. Does park work or not? In reverse, does park work or not? Uh, so there might be a few more states here that we need to think about. Some uh, a little extra. They don't, all the states aren't given to you like on, off, mute. The states were pretty clear at that one. All right, any questions about the question? Right, let's wrap up a little bit of our thinking on the state pattern, the entire Minecraft game. Yes, I can do that in half an hour or so. Uh, a telephone, maybe. That's an interesting one. It's a little similar to the homeworks. It might be why that was suggested. Uh, Minecraft Scala Edition. Minecraft was at least originally written in Java, so it looks like Scala code when it's compiled. The, uh, so the state pattern, just to wrap up some of the state pattern, the pros, this helped us organize our code, especially when we have a class that significantly changes its behavior depending on its internal state. If a car's parked or in drive, all, everything you can do with that, uh, that car, uh, at least the accelerator, has a different behavior um, depending on that. If a TV's on or off, all the buttons have very different behavior. 
uh, depending on that state. So when we have one class that we create objects of that have different behavior, very different behavior depending on circumstances, we can start thinking of the state pattern. Especially if it's very complicated behavior that's changing. The state pattern helps us organize our code and helps us to implement the methods of that code. Each method is very short, concise, and separated from the rest of the code. We have this idea of separation of concerns or encapsulation, which we do a lot in this course, but I never call it by name. I, I should start calling it by name more often. We're encapsulating the functionality. In this state, when this API method is called, what should be the behavior? And just have that behavior for that state, for that API call in a method. So it's completely isolated from the rest of your code, and, it can, and we can think about it independently. We can wrap our heads around that one single method um, as long as we have these structures, we have the state diagram and what our state transitions and all that are going to be. Once it's time to actually implement the methods, very easy, very easy to do. The cons, this adds a lot of complexity to our project structure itself. We add a lot of new classes, uh, a lot of new overhead. It can be overwhelming if you're jumping into a new project and you see all these classes. Uh, it can look intimidating, especially if nobody shows you the state diagram. They just show you, you just start looking through the code. It looks like a lot going on, uh, and the the code kind of becomes into uh, turns into spaghetti code where you're jumping around a lot. Okay, I'm, I have this method called, but that causes state transition, so I got to jump over here for the next method call. That can get confusing again if you don't have that state diagram. If you're following the state diagram, it's a lot easier to follow the code. Going into the code itself, eh, not so much. And and when we have different, uh, oh, that, that one I already said. Well, the third bullet point that's not on the slide, I guess. The, uh, we can have a really big blow up in the number of states as well, which pretty much no matter what idea we end up with coding today, we're probably going to see a big blow up in states because again, the lecture questions, the, uh, the homeworks, they're all designed to limit the number of states that you'll need to avoid these exponential blow ups. But we can have an exponential blow up. If we do my default, which I hope we, we're not doing, though I'm not doing Minecraft, elevator's a good one too. We got a couple good ideas here. Uh, either H2O, telephone, elevator, uh, vote now on your phones, I guess. Uh, lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, but, but if we do my default one, my default one is, hell, I might as well put it on the slide, is uh, checking the weather, whether it's rainy, snowing, warm, or cold, uh, depending on whether it's warm, cold, and whether it's precipitating or not. And depending on whether a person is wearing a raincoat, a winter coat, or no coat at all, are they willing to go outside and do something for that, uh, for that day? Are they willing to go embrace the outdoors and, and be active? Uh, and we have these conditions. Uh, but we start seeing this huge blow up in the number of states. So this, the state can either be warm or cold, precipitating or not precipitating, and then three different states depending on the coat, no coat, coat, uh, no coat, raincoat, or winter coat. So we have two choices, another two choices, and then three choices, and we see an exponential blow up in states because we have to multiply those uh, times each other. So it's two times two times three number of total states we can be in. It can be warm, precipitating, and raincoat. It can be cold, not precipitating, no coat, and there ends up being 12 total states at two times two times three. And if we want to add another state, maybe uh, shoes, boots, or, uh, or no footwear, something like that, uh, that's another times three number of states. That's gonna bring us up to 36 states. And then if uh, maybe we want to add a hat to that, wearing a hat or not, uh, the number of states just blows up ridiculous. Wearing a hat or not wearing a hat, now we're up to 72 states. It's gonna keep blowing up exponentially. If we had 10 different binary choices, wearing a hat, not wearing a hat, wearing a coat, not wearing a coat, precipitating, not precipitating. All we need is 10 of those, and we need over 1,000 states. We need 1,024 states. That's a literal, literally the definition of an exponential blow up. It's multiplying each time we add one more, uh, one more thing. It's multiplying by that number of choices. So we can have a huge blow up in the number of states if we're going all in, like we are in the lecture questions and homework, all in on no control flow at all. Every change in behavior has to be a, a, another state. Uh, we're going to see that blow up. That's one of the big downsides of the state pattern. If you're going all in on the state pattern, you think there's nothing else because 
there's nothing else. We have to use the, design, the state pattern for everything. You're going to see a huge blow up in the number of states if you don't have any other uh, any other design decisions that limit that. Uh, so one. No, kind of a warning. I, I don't know how concerned I really have to be with this, but don't use the state pattern everywhere. Uh, this isn't the next like progression of your education, uh, where where you've kind of had a lot of that so far. It's here's a variable. We use variables all the time. Here's a function. Here's a conditional. Here's a loop. Uh, here's objects and classes. Most of those uh, you're just going to use all the time. That's standard fare. Uh, same with. Polymorphism, you're going to use that pretty much wherever you go, unless you end up at a, a place that does pure functional programming. Uh, but the state pattern isn't necessarily that next, it isn't that next thing. Uh, you might not see this again in your career, which is very possible. Uh, the reason we're covering state pattern is because it's a great application of inheritance and polymorphism, and those are the concepts I want you to really internalize and really understand. If you can do the state pattern, I'd say you got those down pretty good. Uh, and that applies for a learning objective. You show me you can do the state pattern really well, you must understand inheritance and polymorphism. I shouldn't say must, there, I'm sure there'll be some weird case that I might find during the learning objective thing. Uh, but if you get that third bullet point for the learning objective, I pretty much check you off for the first two as well. The state pattern is an application of those two concepts. And that's what I really need to do, the, uh, uh, that idea. So no, it's not realistic to to ban control flow, I never, I will not claim that control flow is a bad thing. That's just an arbitrary thing that I used to uh, get you to force you to use inheritance and polymorphism to solve your problem. So you can get used to this. Uh, we'll also do the same, a similar thing with functional programming. We'll see functional programming, and I will artificially restrict your toolbox to push you towards functional programming, so you can get a feel for how that works. Then when you get out there in industry, depending on where you work, you might work with on a team that really likes OOP might work with a team that really likes FP, might work with a team that mixes the two and kind of uses each well, however they see fit for certain applications. Uh, but you're likely to see probably both of these uh, throughout your career. I want you to understand how both of them work. Uh, but yeah, to, to summarize that point, uh, you're not just seeing, okay, here's the next thing that everybody in the world does who writes software. We are starting to get some more choices and starting to branch out a bit into here are some options, here's how you can, one of the ways that you can design your software. Uh, so yeah, so when I'm not, when your professor's not forcing you to use this particular state pattern, weigh the pros and cons, think about what the pattern does for you and what it doesn't do for you, but think about those pros and cons. Is the state pattern appropriate for this particular application? Is it going to help me? Do I, do I want to have the blow up in in structural complexity for the decrease in the, in the complexity of each method. Is that something I want? Then think about the state pattern. All right, we got a few good examples. Did anybody? Kind of like elevator. Nobody voted after I said that. Mm -hmm. I mean, technically, Minecraft has two <laughs> mentions. So. Yeah. Do elevator, do it. Thank you. That's all I need. It's the same from the same person, but hey, they're ambitious, so <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. But we got to move on to something. So, with no control flow. Uh, Make an elevator. So I can and be a little more lax with my uh, uh, with my spec sheet here because uh, I don't have to have everything clearly defined for auto grading. So make an elevator instead of write a class named elevator that uh, in this package or whatever. All right. So the API for this. Let's think about what an elevator has uh, up. Ooh, how, how complex do we want to get here? Let's, uh, at least to start, we'll see how far we get. Six floors. I don't know if I want to start with six floors. Let's start with three, though. Three floors. And then up. I got to think about the, my design ahead of time, because I don't want to back myself in a corner where I need a conditional. But if we do up of int, 
I take that int that represents the floor that hit the up button. I, I might have to, uh, let's start with the spec sheet instead of the API. That's what I, I recommend in the slides anyway. Let's, uh, let's start with the, the behaviors we want and then we'll go back to the API and generate our API. So if someone hits the up or down button from a floor, calls the elevator to that floor. You know what, let's, let's keep this a little simpler to begin with. Uh, I mean, we have limited time, so let me get something that at least I know we can get to, and then we'll start adding features after that. So if someone hits, we'll just say the call button, whether it's up or down, I mean, the elevators don't, I mean, I've, I've hit the wrong button before, the elevators don't respect that that much. Uh, but it, it's just using that for the optimizations. And, uh, we're not gonna to get to the point where we're coding all the optimizations anyway, of whether it's currently moving up, can it pick up these people who are also going up? Yes, if they're going down, we can't, let's not, uh, let's not go that far. So it calls the elevator to that floor and picks up the passengers. I guess the elevator doesn't even care if it has passengers or not, does it? Push a floor, button, move to that floor. Can't move Well, door is open. Still, but it would still get the call. to a new floor. If, uh, if the elevator was called to a floor, let's define, let's get nitty gritty with this, the details. The elevator is at floor three, the door is open, somebody's at floor two and hits the call button, and then somebody, while the door's still open, somebody on floor one hits the call button. What do we want the behavior to be for that? How much work do you want me to try to cram into this lecture? Should it override the two? I think it should override the two just so I can get this thing done. Yeah. Okay, Let's say override the two. No elevator for you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, somebody on floor one wants the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> the door is open, so we can't do that. All right, let, let's cut our, our specs off at that. Let's start building this API. So we have the call button with an int for the floor number that was being called. Floor button with an int. I might back myself into a corner, but we'll, we'll deal with that when we get there. Uh, door open. Door close. So these are the different ways the outside world can interact, and I want different behavior based on the current state for each one of these things. Looks like, what does? It'll take an int, so which, which floor was it called, called from? Yep, so int call button of three, somebody on floor three hit the call button. And I think that's it, so with that, let's, Jump into our code. Let's get into IntelliJ here and copy my API and see if we can start thinking about what states we need to implement this thing. So thing, first thing I'm going to do is rename this. If you notice, I'm not just clicking that and renaming the class. This is one thing that you probably see quite a bit today. I ended up doing it a lot in 1 p.m. because I had a lot of typos. Um, is right click, go to rename, and go to refactor. Now when I name this elevator, it also changed the file name in the sidebar, and if I use that anywhere else in my code, and I did that refactor, it's going to change it in every instance where this class was used. Wherever it was imported, wherever it was accessed, wherever new instances of this were called, changes it everywhere. Yeah? Would that also be the uh, function, like the function name 
Yep. Yep. If I want to change the function name, right click, refactor. So if you did your whole, uh, all, an entire assignment and it's all perfect, everything's great, but you have one typo in one method or one class or whatever, right click, rename, refactor, give it the right name, and everything updates, resubmit, and you're done. All right, so let's get a couple things here set up. I want to, I want a variable for my state of type state equals new. Uh, we didn't define our initial state. Let's say uh, we don't have any states yet, do we? The, so the states are going to be floor one open, open door. This. I don't like the way that looks. Yeah, Do I want to spell this out though? Let, let's just see how this goes, and we'll start off with we'll start off with just like one or two floors, and uh, and see if we can generalize this. I don't know if I can generalize it without uh, without using a. I don't know. We'll try it. We'll try to get there. Uh, if we can have as many floors as, as possible without, uh, without using a conditional is what I'm trying to say. Without using a conditional. All right. So let's define our methods. Def call button floor int unit equals this dot state dot call button of floor. This is functionality. We're going to defer to our state for functionality. Call button, floor button, door open, door close. Okay, but we got a lot of red here because we don't have any state classes. So what I like to do when I have the state pattern is create a new sub package for all my states. I want to keep my states a little bit hidden, a little bit out of the way because the elevator class, that's what the outside world is going to interact with. Elsewhere in my code, other classes are going to say new elevator. They don't care that it has states. They don't care that it's using the state pattern. Nobody cares about that outside of building the functionality for this class, nor should they. That's the idea of writing an API. You tell somebody, hey, I have these API methods that you can call. You don't have to care how I implemented these and how I built the functionality. I happen to use the state pattern, but whatever. Uh, they just call those methods and test it. Now, you're testing for all these state uh, for the like calculator, microwave, for all these states, your testing has no mention of any state pattern. You could build the, rebuild the whole thing with functional programming or with just procedural programming. Uh, your test suite would not change at all. So, uh, so we want to hide this behavior a little bit. I'll just have, I'll call it elevator states for my package. Create a new abstract class for Elevator state, which is actually the wrong thing. This is going to take an ele elevator. <laughs> what is that? Elevator, ele, ele. Which, which one is the right one? Because I spelled it a few different ways. <laughs> it is double E? Okay. Elevator. I'm uh, more of a computer science guy than a, an English guy. <laughs> you can't tell. Uh, so I, I wanted to find these override. Why did I write that? So I'm going to define these all with default behavior of doing nothing. 
And then in each of one of my states, if I want any of these methods to not do anything, I'm just not going to override them. So let's get our API. Uh, and at least one state, our, my goodness, I'm never going to remember this one. Floor one. Floor open door. I just deleted the one. Extends elevator state. Elevator. You know what? Let's let's leave these in here. Then any ones we don't need, we can delete later. All right. So now we got to think about the states that we're going to need. When when are these methods going to change? Uh, change behavior. Uh, the call button is going to be different whether the door is open or closed. So that's going to change uh, depending on that. The floor button is the same thing. It only cares whether the door is open or closed. The door open and closed methods, uh, those are going to have some effect all the time. Right? It's, I guess this one isn't as complicated as I thought. So we're really concerned about whether the door is open or closed. So let me create another abstract state. of open door. And close door. I'm going to write these abstract. They do have, let's give that another try. They do have full functionality. Same with the state, elevator state does have full functionality. It doesn't do anything, but all the methods are implemented. So these don't have to be abstract classes, but if I call them abstract, if I label them as abstract, I'm going to prevent anyone from creating instances of these states. You can't actually be in the elevator state or the door open state or the door closed state uh, because we need to know what floor we're on. We need more information. So I'm going to call those abstract. And then floor one open door is going to be extending open door. Floor one closed door. We'll start with just two floors and see if we can generalize this. Then floor two closed door. all this red. Uh, so I just had a shortcut option enter on Mac. I don't recall what it is on Windows. Uh, but I uh, to uh, automatically import those classes, uh, just a keyboard shortcut to say, hey, look for a class of this name and then import it. If there are multiple classes with the same name, it'll give me a list of all the classes with that name and I'd have to pick the right one to be able to get that. There's no other, nobody else had a class with these names. so. Uh, I ain't got to worry about that that one. Uh, get rid of my notes here. We got rid of all that red, and we do have a functioning door, but not with uh, any real functionality. So let's go to floor one open door and start building some functionality. So if you know, what, I want to generalize this uh, generalize this sooner rather than later. So there is something I could do here. I can go into my API and split this I can change this like this and have separate methods because I do want to transition to different states depending on that int uh, I'm not really going to be able to do that without control flow so I can do this but I'm gonna try to go for the whole shot here and do some we haven't seen in the other lectures, but I, I think, I don't know if we can get around this otherwise, is uh, instead of just taking an elevator here, take a floor. I'm 
We might be able to trim this all the way down to two states, actually. We might get rid of the abstract on these ones. Let's give that a try. Have our elevator start and just open door on floor one. I want uh, right, we started an open oh, open door. So let's go to open door and start building some functionality. So if I receive a call. I want to do nothing, so I'll keep the default behavior. I hear a floor button. No, we don't want to do nothing. A call or a floor button, these should both have the same behavior. We want to go move to that floor. So these both have the same behavior, but since the door's open, I can't move to that floor until the door closes. So once the door closes, I want to immediately go to the floor uh, that's been called. So I am going to need another state here. Bless you. And let's call that open door floor ready. Let's get rid of these floor specific classes. So if the doors open and I receive a call, I'm going to move into this dot elevator dot state is going to equal new open door floor ready this dot elevator floor. Floor button has the same behavior. We probably could combine these into one API method. Oh, I'm looking at it, but I don't want to go back to the redesign of my API at this point. Let's uh, get this thing going. So door open, no behavior. The door's already open. Door closed, we're going to move into the door closed state. Closed door. Uh, you know, that actually works, but, uh, but let me change this to current floor. I didn't use that variable yet, so I don't have to refactor. And I need to remember what floor I'm on. Oh my goodness, the double letter will trip me up. And the open door floor ready needs to know the current floor and the floor to which it's supposed to go. If the floor ever closes. So open door. Oh, come on, why'd you eat my other one? All right. So when I when we hit the call or floor button, the door's still open. But uh but we have to track this next floor that we're going to. So we're moving into this floor is ready. So as soon as the door closes, we're moving from current floor to whatever floor was hit, was pressed for these buttons. If the door closes, we're going into the door closed state and that's it. In the open door floor ready, the call button is going to override whatever floor was pressed. And I, yeah, I knew I was going to get that. Um, oh. You know what? I want that to stay fail. I'm going to do this a little bit different way. This dot elevator dot state equals new open door floor ready. This dot elevator current floor, floor. And since I'm inside this scope, there's a local variable named floor. This is going to refer to this floor. We're not going to check the outer scope and find this floor. Since there is something in the inner scope, there's something in this 
stack frame for this method call, we don't have to expand our search to the state variables. So it will be that duplicate variable name isn't going to trip us up. So a little flashback to stacks at that point. Um, and then same thing when the floor button is called. We're going to override what floor we're ready to go to if that door ever gets closed. If the door's open, door open pressed, okay, the door's already open. And finally, we get to some functionality. If the door closes, we're going to move to the floor that we're supposed to go to. So let's just do a quick print line here. You know what, we don't have to do that, do we? Yeah, let's, in the interest of time, seven minutes, yeah, let's, let's just print this out. So let's print moving from current floor to floor. And just to make it clear, this dot, this dot. This dot elevator dot state equals new uh, closed door elevator this dot elevator this dot floor. So we're no longer at the current floor. We're going to have the door closed at that new floor, the door close is going to have to have, oh, we already added that, the constructor for the floor. And the door close, we don't need a door close and a door close floor ready, because if the floor is ready and the door is closed, the elevator's moving. We're, we're getting out of there. So door closed, call button, this dot elevator dot state, we're just moving right on. We're moving to that floor. New Closed door, this dot elevator floor, not this dot floor, but the floor from, uh, from the parameters. Same here. Wow. And the elevator's moving. Let's print something every time the elevator is moving. Open door, floor ready, add this statement. So every time we actually move this elevator, moving from this dot floor to our local variable floor. So this one is referring to the parameter. This, since I explicitly said this dot, we're referring to the state variable. If the door is closed, no big deal. If the door open button is pressed, we're not printing anything out. We're moving back to the open door state with no floor ready. Uh, and close in, that looks like it. So each method, one or two lines, and of course we would add more functionality than just printing to the screen, but we have the, uh, we have all the information we need, the functionality we need to start actually building this out actually taking passengers and, and doing things like that. Um, what, what was it? Yeah, we, we don't have any limits on floors. We can go to floor negative 1,000 too if we want. We have no, no restrictions at all. <laughs> like I think that's gotta make one of our test cases. Test this. Oh my goodness. Test this. It's one of the best uh, questions in office hours, by the way, when they when everything works locally but it breaks in auto lab and just says error and stuff. And then I look at their check their names and it's got that underline that says it's spelled wrong. It's like, the, the ID's trying to help. Uh, I had that same thing right here. I had my stuff spelled wrong. Oh, well, it happens. Uh, test elevator, so let's create a new elevator. Uh, 
elevator. Now I do have to spell it right because it's we got there because that doesn't autocomplete. I don't know why, but in that situation, it doesn't autocomplete for me. New elevator of uh, defaults to floor one, right? Let's start hitting some buttons on this thing and see if we get the right print statements out. Uh, of course, we don't have any way to access the floor. We would have an API method to say get current floor. Uh, and we would use that for testing. If this were set up as a better question, as a question that was going to be submitted, we would have that. Uh, for now, let's, we can't have any asserts. There's none to assert because we don't have access to anything. Um, but let's just see the print statements and make sure that it works, uh, that it works the way we want it to. So let's call negative 10,000 elevator dot. Let's close the door. Elevator dot floor button negative twenty. Elevator dot open door. Elevator dot call just mash this button a few times. Uh, let's go up a little bit now. Then close the door, and then we should finally get get that movement. All right, so so we would expect nothing to happen here. Once the door closes, let's get another let's get another uh, another thing here. We expect nothing to happen here. When negative ten thousand is called, we expect the negative ten to be overridden. When the door closes, we're going to go from floor one to negative 10,000. When the floor button for negative 20 is hit, we're going to go to negative 20. When the door is open, nothing is printed to the screen at least. All these call button mashing, nothing's gonna happen. And then 100,000 and close the door, we're going to move from negative 20 to 100,000. Let's hold our breath and hope, my, <laughs> hope everything works fine. I'm confident, I, I think it's gonna work, but let's take a gander. There's always the possibility I missed something. Yeah, all right. We got there. All right, any quick questions? What's that? I cannot. I'm working 60 hour weeks as it is. I cannot. Uh, all right, with that. Uh, yeah, have a great weekend. I'll see you Monday.